You know, I don't understand this podcasting thing. How come you boys can't have those keg parties and chase the girls like all the other nice boys do? Y'all are nerds. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and is the first half of 2020 really over and we didn't even have locusts or wildfires in Australia? Oh, wait, we we did have, we did have wildfires in, huh, well, even though this year has been innovative to say the least, today we welcome a guy talking about how innovation works. It's TED speaker and columnist for the London Times and Wall Street Journal, Matt Ridley, plus Barstool Sports CEO Dave Portnoy has been in the news lately. We'll talk about his view of trading stocks with the CEO of M1 Finance, Brian Barnes. Of course, we'll still manage to toss out the Haven Lifeline to Adam, who has a question about why people continually make the same investing mistakes. And of course, I'll share my amazing trivia. And now, two guys who've never been mistaken for innovators... It's Joe and O J J J J G. Pushing as many buttons as possible. By the way, I hear a noise like this. All I can think of is what a petri dish of people that is. It's, it's me walking into a room. <laughs> well, to any room. If we hear one of these. One of these people cough. (laughs) All of a sudden, all the cheering stops. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Stacking Benjamins. I am Joe Saul. See how average Joe money on Twitter and across the card table from me lounging today. You had to pull up the most comfortable chair in the room today. I don't know. Your your chair, which is my chair, is actually pretty comfortable, too. You like how I stole your chair, so you stole the comfortable chair. That's good. They're kind of both comfortable. I mean... I don't buy uncomfortable chairs for myself, so everything it does, that's in it doesn't have to my be, basement. You say it doesn't have to be either or. That's right. Hey, uh, if you want the best of all worlds when it comes to whatever project you're working on, uh, say hello to Fiverr. Big thanks to Fiverr for supporting Stacky Benjamin. So easy to find freelance talent for your business, your product. Don't waste any more time. Get 10% off and the service you deserve by going to FIVERR.com and use code SB. We got Matt Ridley on with us today. Matt talking about some innovation. Of course, you probably heard Matt Ridley talk about a lot of different things, but he is an awfully smart man. And when it comes to this idea, OG, that they're coming for our jobs, last week, Adam Davidson had an opinion there. Adam's opinion basically being, yes, they are. Mm -hmm. However, that's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. We'll see what Matt Ridley has to say. But first, we've got a couple of, believe it or not, a guy named Dave Portnoy in the news. Again. (laughs) Right. Still. When isn't he in the news? Let's get this party started. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our first headline comes to us from financialplanning.com. Uh, it's written by Bloomberg News. Vanguard and State Street resist the hot new ETF craze. You know what hot new ETF craze they're talking about, OG? I would say smart beta, but that's already been. No, out that's so the well. old hot craze. Yeah. This is the new hot craze. One of Wall Street's hottest innovations being hailed as the potential key to luring trillions of actively managed dollars to the booming market for ETFs. Yet two of the industry's biggest players want no part of it for now, the piece says. Vanguard and State Street say their in-wait-and-see mode is active, non-transparent funds take their first crucial steps in the $4.3 trillion U.S. arena for ETFs. These products come with many of the benefits of traditional ETFs, but drastically reduce disclosure requirements. There you go. (laughs) That's way easier. That makes so-called ANTS a likely conduit to bring stock picking strategies to the exchange traded universe. Market's largest player BlackRock's already filed to use the structure after the funds debuted in April. JP Morgan Chase also plans its own ants estimates. Non-transparent ETFs could ultimately command more than $7 trillion in assets. 
I like this idea and this usage of the word lure. <laughs> so I guess that the benefit of this is that the actively managed, active managers, I should say, can get into this world without having to open up their trench coat. Yeah. So, so to speak. if they have a strategy on how they're picking investments, they don't have to tell everybody immediately. Yeah. Yeah. W- which I think for active funds is a, is a good thing. I mean, that's, that's what, your, if that's your, if you've got a system that you'd rather not share with everyone. Well, it's the only thing you're selling. Uh-huh. I mean, if you're a mutual fund manager, you're selling that we do things a certain way. And if I've have an open architecture ETF, that it's easy for somebody else to plug into. Mm-hmm. There's no reason to do that. Yeah, because a mutual fund, you only disclose it quarterly. Uh, how is this better for investors? Is this better for investors? Well, if you're an investor in investments, yeah. You know, like if you own shares in State Street, I think it's a really great thing as an investor. In- <laughs> I didn't know where you were going. <laughs> <Black Rock. laughs> if, you, if you have shares in these companies. Yes. It's good because the lure of trillions of dollars could lure. make you some money. Yep. I guess. I'd, I'd, whatever. I don't have an opinion about them. I mean, I think at mutual funds, people always have this like either or opinion, right? It's either, oh, I got to be all passive or all active or all passive funds are great or all active funds suck or all passive funds are inexpensive. All active funds are expensive. And none of that is true. I mean, some of it is true. If you look at the list of uh, top performing investments, top performing mutual funds for the year, they're going to be actively traded by definition. I mean, there's going to be some that, so, so the whole idea of like, well, you can't outperform the market. Well, that's not true. People do it. What we want to think about is, is it worth the cost? So if they can manage to produce these products that allow smart people to help other people with money and keep the costs a little bit lower. You know, that's a good thing. Well, and as you know, I've been fascinated by the move in active trading from some manager with an idea to much more of a machine driven approach an algorithm driven approach where you're, you're studying things. I remember, you know, I mean, we look at the performance of while, while it was alive it never attracted many assets, but the buzz index. Yeah, we had Jamie on here a lot, and look at what that what look at what that that idea did. Consistently outperformed the S and P five hundred. Right. So if you can take something that is an idea, and I, I don't, I certainly am not advocating your entire portfolio, you know, into one singular idea. But if you can bring the world's smartest people of investing to a, a retail environment. I think this also opens up opportunities for people who normally wouldn't be interested in investing money for you. I was reading parts of um, Dalio's book over the break and did some like thumbing through the Googler on, you know, hey, how do I, yeah, I got a couple grand. Let me see what he can do with it. You know, just to, just to see, maybe you know what what what's his minimum. See, if maybe Ray will help a yeah help a guy out. Yeah. And uh, turns out his minimum seven and a half billion. Oh, you know, so just 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 shy of it a little bit right now, personally. But if he's got an idea that or, or a way to help investors, he's pretty smart. He's got a whole bunch of really smart people that work for him, and and they can make a product that he might be interested in in starting. I don't think that's a terrible thing. It's going to be interesting. I do think that the uh, the death knell that a lot of people have talked about of actively managed funds has, has never really happened. And, um, and I think as we see changes like this, it, it's going to keep it interesting. But Vanguard, by the way, a lot of people wonder about that. A lot of uh, people listen to this show, I'm sure, use Vanguard in their portfolio. Number two in exchange traded funds, it says here is in no rush to wade into untested waters, according to its head of ETF product management. Quote, This is an opportunity for us to learn from what others are doing, said Rich Powers, head of ETF product management at Vanguard. Investors make their way to great active strategies, regardless of whether it's first to market. Well, sure. I think people are fighting or think they're fighting the wrong battle. They're saying, hey, I think active management's bad. No, you don't. You think the high cost of active management is bad. Again, so this is just kind of bringing that cost structure down a little bit. 
I'm glad you brought that up because I'm sure there's people out there going, wait a minute, a guy at Vanguard said great active strategies. Yeah. Wait, what? Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on. Yeah. Well, I mean, Vanguard has active funds. <gasps> Did I say that? So it's not about active and passive. It's about the cost structure. <laughs> Heard it here first, folks. In our second headline, news from, I found this in the New Zealand Herald, OG. Inside Robinhood, the stock traders causing havoc on Wall Street. And of course, I know that you and I kind of rolled our eyes about this. But one of those people is a gentleman from Barstool Sports named uh, Dave Portnoy. And we've talked about Dave Portnoy a few times here. But uh, Portnoy has made some waves recently with the tweet that he had where it says stocks are easy in the background. And actually, to help us out with this on uh, My Dad Shortwave Radio, we have the founder and CEO of our friends at M1 Finance, Mr. Brian Barnes. Brian, how are you, man? I'm doing well. Thanks well, for having me on. Well, sure. You've been busy, though. I don't know if you've had time to follow Twitter. Have you heard this uh, Dave Portnoy tweet? I get a good chuckle out of his videos. <laughs> well, let's 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 listen to this one together because I'm going to want to get your reaction. Is a guy who who may or may not have a brokerage firm. You know, here we go. This is a, a tweet from uh, Dave Portnoy, whose uh, Twitter handle is Stool Presidente. Here it is. Every single day, it's the same thing. I wake up, I look, and we're up a bazil. We're up a bazil. Airlines, cruises, uh, Smith and Wesson. I gave that out. Yes, that's up a bill. Everything's up a bill. It's green, 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 green. See that behind me? Stocks are easy. They are easy. They are easy when you subscribe to DDGG Global. All you do is you pick a couple letters. Doesn't even really matter the combo. It can be TTWO. It can be CMI. It can be uh, SWBI. You just take a couple letters, you mush them together, you press buy, 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 and you watch it go up, up, up. That's how this works. I'm sure when you guys, Brian, are doing any tutorials of M1 Finance, isn't that what you do? Just tell them stocks are easy, you just buy, 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 and everything goes up, up, up? No, not, not quite. You know, <laughs> I, I wish we could be as entertaining as, as Dave Portnoy, but don't know if that's the most sound financial advice out there. Does that worry you that he's saying this type of stuff or you just find it to be entertainment? Um, I think it's going to be a combination of both. I think that he would say that it's entertainment. I think most of the listeners would agree that it's entertainment. But I mean, there is a portion of his listeners and portion of what he's saying that they are sort of trying to say that there's truth behind these statements and that trading frequently, buying any stock, betting big is the way to quick success. And I think that's a dangerous uh, perspective to have people buy into. I know that we saw numbers and we did a story last week about the number of Robin Hood traders specifically that got burned by things like Hertz, where Hertz is clearly already bankrupt, Brian, and you've got people out there buying it on, on an app like Robinhood. Have you guys seen people try to do the same things with M1 Finance that they're, they seem to be flocking to Robinhood over? You know, M1 versus a lot of the different brokerage firms, we really prioritize long-term investing over trading. And if you look at every brokerage firm, every online brokerage firm, they're primarily built around a trade, and that's how they make their money. That's what they want to encourage. And M1 is much more geared towards portfolio management. Do you want to establish ownership in companies and systematically add to it over long periods of time? And sort of the, the benefit to investing is the ownership of the company, and that's what you're trying to accrue. And so, you know, I, I think our user base has a longer term perspective, and they're not trying to buy at 10 a.m., sell at 2 p.m., and you know, hope that they guessed right on the way that the price is moving, which is really what's happening with a lot of these, you know, hot stock names. And I know Robinhood gets blamed. Robinhood probably act like they have a lot of users. They probably don't have the, the dollar volume to move these stocks as much as they are moving. And so this is, you know, writ large across Ameritrade, E-Trade, Fidelity, Schwab, you know, all, all the large brokerage firms, the active traders are are doing some crazy things with individual names. Do you think this is because sports aren't playing right now, Brian, that you've got all these sports bettors out there. Now they're betting on stocks instead. 
it's possible. You know, I've definitely heard that as a hypothesis, and I'm not immune to the boredom of sitting at home and not having other <laughs> social activities to, to do. Um, so, you know, it, it seems reasonable to me. That being said, I think the financial market is so massive. There's always going to be a combination of retail investors, retail traders, and then those are going to be utterly dwarfed by institutional money. So big hedge funds, big pensions, and you know, those players can also be investors and traders, and they'll move markets significantly more than the average retail person. Well, it sounds like kind of uh, what you were saying earlier, though, is that you may agree with Portnoy here on buy, buy, buy. But when it comes to randomly mixing letters together, that might not be your point of view? Yeah, that accurately sums it up. There's a huge difference between when you're making a trade or investing in something, whether you view it as a random assortment of letters and it has a random price and it moves in weird ways and you can try to draw things on charts to predict where it's going to move. That I view as gambling and there's it is very difficult to find a strong foundation or basis on why the price is going to fluctuate in short amount of time. We've seen the market drop 35% and then rebound back to where it is, you know, in the last couple of months. So on any given day, the market can do pretty wild and crazy things. And it's, it's very hard to predict. That being said, when you're investing, there is a foundation for that. It's just, you're buying ownership of an underlying company. That company is producing something that has value, and you're trying to establish ownership in that and get the benefits of ownership over long periods of time. And I think that's a easier decision to be made. It's more aligned with your long-term wealth building, and that's the, the type of investing that we like to advocate for on the M1 platform. You know, with a message like that, Brian, you should be on Twitter making entertaining videos about it. <laughs> I, I do think one of the negative things about finance is making it way too boring. And so, you know, <laughs> there there is some excitement or enjoyment that people should get out of it to participate in your finances. But the notion that it should be the most exhilarating thing in the world, I think you do move into the, the gambling <laughs> realm. Uh, I think those are wise words, my friend. Hey, speaking of exciting, you guys have had some exciting stuff happening at uh, M1. If you've got another second, tell everybody what's going on there. Yeah, for sure. So M1, the product and platform continue to grow. So we started with our free automated investing platform. We then added M1 Borrow, which lets you borrow at rates as low as 2% using your portfolio as collateral. And we just released M1 Spend, which is an integrated high-yield checking account that can give you up to 1% interest on your cash balance and 1% cash back on your card. So it's moving into this sort of you know finance super app, so to speak. And the other exciting thing is we just raised an additional $33 million to add to the product capability, the growth, and the like. And so continuing to just power on, create more, drive value to our users. I thought that $33 million was going to all go into the pocket of that founder. That's not true? <laughs> Unfortunately not. <laughs> <laughs> Might not be the best use of funds for the company, but fun for you, man, for a little while, you know. Yeah, it's absolutely exciting. You know, the company over the last year has more than 3 x from a user count and assets perspective. The company's doubled from a headcount perspective. Everything we've done life to date has been on $20 million. And so this is 150% more money than we've ever raised. And so we have grand ambitions for what we're going to do moving into the future. Well, thanks for hanging out with us for a few minutes. And uh, by the way, we'll link to Brian and to M1 Finance on our show notes page at Stacking Benjamins. But but Brian, great talking to you again. It's been too long. And uh, thanks for laughing about this kind of fun tweet from Dave Portnoy. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Big thanks to Brian Barnes for calling in. Hey, before we wrap this up, OG, let me tell you about one of the ultimate life hacks. You and I both know it's hard to find time to sit down and read and learn more. When you don't have free time, you can't read or work on personal development. There is this incredible app. What if? If, if there is only a way. What if there were an incredible app that solves this problem? I highly recommend it because there is one. It's called Blinkist. Blinkist is super unique. Works on your phone, your tablet, your web browser. Blinkist takes the best key takeaways, the need-to-know information from thousands of nonfiction books and condenses them down into just 15 minutes that you can read or listen to. If, if you don't have 15 minutes, probably time to loosen up your schedule. I think a guy named Cliff came up with this. Cliff said, let's take some notes. 
Yeah, he was like, I, but I want to bring it to the 21st century. So let's make an app. And make it where you can learn as quick as you can blink. Ah, that's where that came from. I'm, I'm, I'm sure. It's a theory. Could be, could be a bad one. Successful people, you know, like business leaders, are well known for reading lots of books. Blinkist is made for busy people like you who want to get the main points of a book quickly so you can start using that information right away. And with its audio feature, Blinkist makes it easy to finish a book during your commute, on your lunch break, or while you exercise. 12 million people are using Blinkist right now, and it is a massive and growing library from self-help, business, health to history books, finance books on Blinkist. The latest titles from best-selling list, as well as classic nonfiction titles you always meant to read, but never had time to. I like Blinkist, OG, because there are books that I want to read cover to cover, and there are books where I just want to get the meat. Almost uh, every book is the book where you want to get the meat, isn't it? Just No, there's, there's some books where I feel like I want to get the whole, whole experience, but you're right. Like War and Peace? <laughs> Have you, have you heard uh, you like heard, this Hamilton book that I'm reading? Have you heard 800 pages? Emo Phillips talk about uh, War and Peace. Uh. It's a, a book like that'll keep a fire burning for hours. <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably don't want that. But it, but it took my book reading from a single book, maybe once every three weeks to a month, yeah. to I can read four books a week Boom. without it, without Knock even it trying. By the way, yeah. Yeah. So books like uh, The Barefoot Investor by Scott Pape, Everything is Effed, a book about hope, Sapiens. Mm. Sapiens is a fantastic book. Naval game. says to read that one. D yeah. Did you read that yet? Uh, no. No. That's got to go on your Blinkist list. It sounds long. It's not long if you do Blinkist, just like uh, Clever Girl Finance. We have Bullis Acumbi on. Clever Girl Finance on there. She talked about that. Uh, of course, her friend Chris Hogan mm -hmm. on Blinkist with Everyday Millionaires. You could, uh, Nathan Locke has been on our show, uh, How to Be a Capitalist Without Any Capital. With Blinkist, you get unlimited access to read or listen to a massive library of condensed nonfiction books, all the books you want, all for one low price. So right now, for a limited time, Blinkist is a special offer just for you stackers. You're welcome. Go to Blinkist.com slash SB to try it for free for seven days and you'll save 25% off your new subscription. That's Blinkist spelled B L I N K I S T Blinkist.com slash S B to start your free seven day trial. And you're also going to save 25%, but only when you sign up at Blinkist.com slash S B. I can't believe Brian might not be on board with Dave's bye, strategy. Bye. Bye. You think that's how it works, isn't up, it? Up, up, up. All it does is go up. Yeah. I've been doing it wrong. Portnoy gets in right as the trend is, is headed up and causes this chaos that just makes me, I feel so bad for so many of these young new day traders. Does he have an affiliate agreement with Robinhood or something? Is that the deal? DTDG Global. Didn't you hear that? If you subscribe, it's easy. Huh. See, you subscribe to my stuff. You pay me a bunch of money. I show you that it's easy. I don't know if you know that. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Uh, this is probably as good a time as any to let everybody know about the newsletter I'm launching. <laughs> uh, it's called, it's not that easy. It's difficult, difficult, difficult. You're calling it the FU. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hold on. You're calling it the FUDP newsletter? Exactly. Yes. <laughs> Mine costs twice as much because it's twice as good. Well, it's you, twice as much, but half as good. You get twice the value. I get tw I get four times the value <laughs> right. because it's half as good, but twice the cost. Uh, I think Brian had good lesson number one: stick to your long term investing guns, peeps. And then Gosh, that's so boring. Oh, There's got to be a better solution than isn't it? Just keep doing what you're supposed. Brian's to Brian's approach is so boring, Come and on. then. The second, second idea here is uh, actively managed ETFs. Good for somebody. Maybe not you, but I think we'll wait and see. Matt Ridley. Ridley's books have sold over 
a million copies. That's all. No big deal. Translated in 31 languages. His books before this one include The Red Queen, The Origins of Virtue, Genome, Nature versus Nurture, Francis Crick, The Rational Optimist, and The Evolution of Everything is TED Talk, When Ideas Have Sex, been viewed more than 2 million times. Of course, writes a weekly column for The Times out of London and writes regularly for The Wall Street Journal. Viscount Ridley, he was elected the House of Lords in February 2013, served on the Science and Technology Select Committee 2014-2017. What hasn't he done? You know what he hasn't done until today? He hasn't been on the Stacking Benjamin Show, OG. Just another life goal. Check. I'm sure. So let's say hello to Matt Ridley talking about innovation. And here he is coming down the stairs to the basement. Matt Ridley joins us. How are you, man? I'm great. Really good to be with you today. Well, I'm so happy that you could join us to talk about innovation you create a, quite a line between innovation and invention. And before we start, because this is going to fuel everything you and I talk about, what's the difference between those two terms? Well, it's a difference that to some extent I'm forcing on the language because I'm not sure uh, it's clear what people mean by innovation and invention. But what I mean by it is that invention is coming up with a new idea, designing a prototype or something like that, whereas innovation means making that idea practical, reliable, and affordable so that lots of people adopt it, getting an idea adopted. So it's not just building the first computer, it's actually getting computers out there so ordinary people want to use them. Uh, and I think that's a crucial part of the innovation process and is something that is often overlooked. People tend to think of invention as being key and the innovation bit being easy. I don't think that's true. There's a really nice little story that illustrates the difference between invention and innovation, which Charles Townes, the inventor of the laser, used to tell. And it's about a beaver and a rabbit looking at the Hoover Dam. And the beaver is saying to the rabbit, no, uh, I didn't build it, but it is based on an idea of mine. <laughs> So that's the inventor trying to take credit for all the work done by the innovator. It's funny because when I hear the term innovation, and I think this is like most people, I get excited, right? I think innovation, ooh, this is cool, new things. I remember in the 1970s, uh, my teacher talking about grocery stores of the future and about how we were going to scan our own groceries using UPC codes. And I thought that was phenomenal. And of course, now it's garbage. Right? <laughs> it's, it's something right. that, that really is not the Jetsons. But you make a great point that we, we really resist innovation. And you tell a great story yeah. there about coffee and about <laughs> how historically coffee, something that I had two cups before we talked nobody really wanted, I guess, or people wanted it, but people tried to stifle it. It's actually a really good example of the point you make, which is that innovation, we all think we welcome it. We're all looking forward to it. We all love the idea in abstract of innovation. We all know it's a good thing. We know it's responsible for prosperity. But when confronted with an individual innovation, here's the way the world wants to change, there are all sorts of forces ranged against them to try to stop it. In the case of coffee, coffee came into the Middle East and Europe from uh, uh, Ethiopia, really, in the mid-1500s and spread gradually through Europe. And in the 1500s and 1600s, all over Europe, rulers, kings, you know, generals, whoever was in charge, tried to stop it. Um, they banned it, they outlawed it, they forbade it, they stamped it out, they crushed coffee cups, they did everything they could to stop this ridiculous innovation of a hot black drink that they thought was bad for people. Now, why did they think it was bad for people? Two reasons, basically. One was that there were entrenched, vested interests who wanted it to be bad for people because they didn't like coffee as a th competitive threat, the wine industry, the beer industry. So these guys... These guys actually went out and funded medics to produce research saying coffee is bad for you. It dries up your liver and makes your kidney malfunction and all this kind of stuff. Pseudoscience, but they got it you know, bought and paid for and it made a difference. Um, you know, People began to believe this kind of stuff. The other reason that people kept trying to ban coffee, and by the way, they nearly always failed. I mean, you know, the, the, the sultans in Constantinople banned coffee about 15 times. Uh, and every time it would come back again, you know, it would find a way, you know, it was just too delicious for people not to have it. 
But the reason the sultans and the kings wanted it banned was because coffee was sold in coffee houses. The reason for this, I guess, is because grinding coffee beans is something people weren't, didn't have the equipment to do at home, so people would go to coffee houses. And also when they're there, they drank coffee, and that made them kind of excitable, and so they would sit and chat. So coffee houses became the, the locus of conversation in society. And the trouble with conversation, if you're a king, is that conversation sometimes turns to whether or not the king is doing a good job or a bad job. And sometimes some people come to the view that he's not doing a good job, and they say so in coffee houses. So the rulers are often very explicit about this. I mean, there was a sultan in Constantinople who had killed most of his brothers to get the throne. And he got very paranoid about coffee because he thought people were talking in coffee houses about the fact that he killed most of his brothers. Well, I dare say the subject did come up from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> might, might have crossed one coffee cup or two. There's a, the, actually, the, my favorite story in all that, uh, and I got the, the coffee, I hadn't heard this coffee story. I researched it afterwards, but I hadn't heard it until I read a wonderful book called Innovation and Its Enemies by Calestas Juma, who was a Harvard professor, very sadly died a few years ago. But there's a wonderful story about the king of Sweden banning coffee. Then he has sort of second thoughts. And he said, well, you know, maybe it's not so bad for you. Let, let's find out whether there's any medical reasons why this drink is such a bad idea. And he always advised, I said, no, no, it's a terrible thing, coffee. You've got to get rid of it. And, and he said, well, let's do a controlled experiment. Let's take two convicted murderers in jail and make one of them drink nothing but coffee and the other drink nothing but tea. And we'll see which one dies first. <laughs> It's quite a sensible <laughs> experiment when you think about it. I mean, anyway, this poor coffee drinking prisoner who was presumably bouncing off the walls because <laughs> he was drinking so much I coffee. I can't imagine. He lived forever. <laughs> the first person to die was the doctor overseeing the experiments. That's funny. The second person to die was the tea drinking convict. The third person to die was the king. And the last one left alive was the coffee-drinking convict, which rather proved his point. <laughs> well, and it's funny as you talk about that, about the enemies, I think about who were the friends of innovation. And as I was reading your book, Matt, I kept thinking about the Medicis and the princes of the Renaissance and people like da Vinci and Michelangelo and how, you know, these inventors we're given so many freedoms. Uh, what's really the secret sauce of innovation? Well, I think you've nailed it in the word freedom. My subtitle is and why it flourishes in freedom, referring to innovation. Uh, and I think the, the, the message that came through again and again from all the stories that I tell in the book and all the cases of innovation that I researched was that you had to have freedom. The freedom of the consumer to create the demand for innovation to start with. That's a one that we often forget about. But just as important, the freedom of the innovator to be able to do experiments. It was trial and error that proved to be most important in most innovations. You had to make mistakes and try different things and eventually hit on a way of doing it. Now, if you were told at the beginning of your project, you must invent this, you must go down this avenue, you can't change direction, you can't change your mind, then you can't innovate. Innovators have to be able to change their mind, to try one thing and it doesn't work, to try another and it doesn't work. Uh, Thomas Edison famously tried 5,000 different materials before he settled on Japanese bamboo for the filament of a light bulb, for example. And the inventors of Kevlar, the inventors of Teflon, both at DuPont, the inventor of the post-it note, these people all set out to invent something else and discovered these things by mistake. So you've got to have an enormous amount of freedom. And if you basically look at where innovation happens, it happens in places where people are free to experiment, free to invest, free to fail, uh, free to try again. These kind of freedoms are absolutely central. Is there a, and this you're right, is... by the way, about Renaissance Italy. Um, as you say, innovation in, in art, Leonardo and Michelangelo, couldn't have happened without those Italian city-states, which were surprisingly free compared with almost every other regime of the time. They weren't as free as we would say they should be today, but uh, those city-states were self-governing. They were not part of empires, and that was crucial. 
But these uh, inventors, I mean, my understanding, inventors and uh, artists were also funded, right? Uh, I mean, they, it seemed like they were after this greater good, not after riches. This show is called Stacking Benjamins for a reason. It's about riches, but they had to be funded. Did you find that innovation needs to be funded by the government, by leaders? Yeah, well, innovation generally needs uh, financial support. It can't happen uh, without it. And interestingly, innovation does not happen in desperate, poor societies, which need innovation most, if you like. You know, I mean, necessity is said to be the mother of invention. That really isn't true. Uh, Otherwise, you know, Zimbabwe would be producing more software than California. So innovation tends to happen in prosperous places. But more important, it happens in places where there's a lot of trade going on. And that's because trade brings ideas together. People from different parts of the world meet and and share ideas, and the sharing of ideas produces new ideas and so on. But also, trade tends to generate the profits that then get invested in innovation. And so in a place like, you know, Genoa or Florence in the Renaissance time, like we were talking about, or a place like parts of China a thousand years ago in the Song Dynasty, very prosperous trading cities with a lot of self-government, a lot of self-autonomy, um, or in California more recently, or in Victorian Britain. You know, these these are the places where people are making money and they're investing money. So just in my, the part of Britain where I live, the northeast of England, there's a very good example of this, which is that very successful industrialized economy, very early in the Industrial Revolution, based on coal uh, in this part of the world, New, the city of Newcastle, And why does an Irish engineer come to Newcastle in the 1870s and invent basically the turbine, the the incredibly important technology that underpins our whole economy, everything from uh, the electricity system to the way jets fly through the air? He invents the turbine in Newcastle and not somewhere else because there's cash in Newcastle. There are people making money out of coal and heavy engineering and shipbuilding uh, who are looking for ways to invent that money. Uh, And they want to invent it in uh, innovative projects that might make them even more money. So entrepreneurs like him come looking for the money. Same thing's happening in Silicon Valley today. You have, by the way, you you were talking a little bit about steam. I I was surprised to hear that you and your family have a, you have a close connection to the advent of steam. I was I was really thrilled to to research this because the the invention of the steam engine is I think an incredibly important moment in human history because it's the moment when we link heat to work. We start to use heat to do work. We start to use steam to turn wheels if you like. Before that the work came from human muscles or animals or wind or uh, or water power whereas the heat came from coal and wood and these kind of things, but there was no connection between the two. The steam engine links the two, and it does so very early in the 18th century with a guy called Thomas Newcomen. Newcomen, he's very obscure. We don't really know where he got his ideas from, whether he got them from a brilliant French scientist called Denis Papin or not. But one of the places his ideas got taken up was here in the northeast of England, and I was thrilled to discover that it's one of my direct ancestors who was his main uh, investor up here who bought and built 15 of the machine, the early machines, huge machines, the size of a house, you know, which clanking great machines with very low efficiency, which was the so-called atmospheric engine, which worked on creating a vacuum when you cooled steam, which created the suction that pulled water out of the mine. And this guy, Nicholas Ridley, he was um, basically a client of well, not of Thomas Newcomen, but of Thomas, of one of Thomas Newcomen's uh, um, sidekicks. So I feel a tiny bit of um, <laughs> distant pride in yeah. having a member of my family help kickstart the Industrial Revolution. It's a small part to play, but it's nice. But it seems very communal, even as you tell that story, talking about your family being a member of this community. I'm thinking on a tactical level, if I'm someone that wants to be an innovator, it seems to me, listening to you speak, Matt, that the uh, that I need to, you know, here in the age of even the computer, I need to be where other innovators are. It's this mix of ideas that's the most important ingredient. Is that would that be fair? Absolutely. This is this is a very strong lesson that emerges from all the stories you tell. Uh, the people who think that innovation is a lonely business where you go off into a corner and you don't tell anyone what you're up to and you emerge five years later with a brilliant idea which works first time, they fail. 
They fail every time. There's a very nice controlled experiment in this. In the early uh, years of the last century, uh, the US government gave a huge amount of money to uh, a very brilliant scientist to invent an aeroplane. Off he went. He was the head of the Smithsonian Institution. I'm suddenly blanking on his name for a second. It'll come to me in a, in a minute. But he designed an aeroplane in secret uh, and then unveiled it in front of a huge crowd and it flopped. It fell straight into the Potomac River and the pilot had to scramble out and swim to the shore. At the same time, just 10 days later, on the one of the barrier islands off North Carolina, two young bicycle engineers from Dayton, Ohio, did achieve in getting an aeroplane into the air, a powered plane for the first time. The Wright brothers, of I course. I think you have to say spoiler alert there. <laughs> 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 you told us the end of the story. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, exactly. But the point is, the Wright brothers had done everything right, if I could use that pun, because they they had consulted everybody and anybody who'd made any attempt to understand flight. And they had built lots of experimental gliders, but they corresponded obsessively with people in Germany, people in France, people elsewhere in the US, people in Australia, even there was one guy to say, look, you know, what, what, what are you thinking about the shapes of the wing? You know, does it, what, what's the ratio between the depth of the wing and the length and the, and the width of the wing that you think is right, et cetera, et cetera. So they had to be embedded in a network of other people to glean the best ideas. Whereas this other guy whose name still hasn't come to me, I mean, I know it so well, <laughs> but it's one of these things anyway. Yeah. Um, it Maybe it's, it, he deserves it to, to have his name <laughs> forgotten. <laughs> Um, he's well known. I mean, it's not a secret, but um, uh, there we go. I wanted to ask, as you were researching innovation, and uh, and you tell incredible stories about people like Thomas Edison, as well as, you know, we talked a little bit about coffee. There's so many great stories. But when you were researching this, what surprised you the most about innovation that you didn't think of as you were setting off on this project? Do you know what? I think what surprised me the most was how similar some of the stories were. So whether I was going back 500 years, in fact, I even go back 40,000 years to the invention of the dog as an innovation, <laughs> uh, or whether I was talking about something that happened very recently, I kept seeing the same patterns crop up. So here's a good example. The light bulb was invented separately by 21 different people. Thomas Edison was only one of 20 plus people who came up with the same idea at the same time, which is really weird when you think about it. How come, you know, that should happen? It's not because some cosmic deity suddenly sent the idea light bulb down onto planet Earth and it landed in 21 different places at once. It's because the ingredients necessary to put together a light bulb were suddenly there together for the first time. The, the glass blowing technology, the vacuum pump technology, the use of electricity on a widespread scale, and the idea of lighting through using electricity. These were all around. Arc lighting was already in use. It was inevitable, in other words, that in the 1870s, we would have light bulbs. You don't need Thomas Edison. He can be run over by a tram and we still get light bulbs uh, out of the 1870s. Do you, you see what I mean? The, you needed the culture. It was ripe in the yeah, culture. Yeah. Then again, in the early 1990s, the same is true of the search engine, when you think about it. You don't need Google to be invented for us to have search engines, or Yahoo and lots of others. They invented search engines around the same time. As soon as you've invented the internet, it's inevitable you're going to invent the search engine. And it's probably inevitable that it's going to be the main way you're going to make money out of the internet, by the way. That's another point. But here's the other similar thing about those two stories. Nobody saw either of them coming. If they're so inevitable, how come nobody predicted them? There's nobody in the 1860s saying, you know what? In 20 years' time, we're going to have glass bulbs with electric lighting. And there's nobody in the 1980s, or at least very few people in the 1980s saying, you know what? Once we've networked all these computers... Random search is going to be an incredibly important part of our lives. Right. Uh, if I could have a device in my hand, Matt, where I could get the secrets of the universe and use it to watch cat videos, that will be my future. Nobody well, was saying that. Th they were saying we will wander endlessly and amazed through a 
cornucopia of new experiences on the internet. But they were not saying we will set out to search what is the best hotel in Reykjavik or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Want... <laughs> or the cheapest hotel in Reykjavik. Right. So, yeah, I'm sorry. Right. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You you spend the end of your book as a prognosticator. I thought it was pretty cool. You even say, you're like, listen, I don't have a crystal ball, but by 2050, based on your research, these are the things that could happen. You talk a lot of, about health, about longevity. I was curious on a financial show, what about the future of our financial system, about the mm. way that we transact monetarily? When you look at innovation in the future, where do you think we might be ripe there, Matt? Well, this is very interesting because I think the whole blockchain revolution is at a very early stage. And if it can lead to currencies independence of, independent of governments, then it will have a huge impact on our financial system. It'll lead to smart contracts. It'll lead to, as I say, inflation-free currencies. It'll have to run the gauntlet of a lot of opposition from governments and other things. But here's the interesting thing about that. When you're at the beginning of a technological revolution like that, it is often very disappointing for the first 10 years at least. The internet was pretty disappointing in the 1990s. By the end of the 1990s, people were saying, you know what, I'm not sure this internet thing's all it's cracked up to be. I mean, you know, shopping's still the same, et cetera, et cetera. 10 years later, they're not saying that. The same is true of genomics. In the early 2000s, we had Bill Clinton and Tony Blair announcing the uh, sequencing of the human genome, saying this means the end of disease. This is incredibly exciting. And 10 years later, everyone's saying, well, where's that? You know, what's happened? So you get, and by the way, I credit this point to a guy called Roy Amara, who was a futurologist and computer scientist in Silicon Valley. And he said, uh, we underestimate the impact of technologies in the long run, but we overestimate them in the short run. So if I'm right about blockchain, it's going to be really disappointing till about 2030. And then it's suddenly going to start changing the world quite fast. Now, please don't hold me to that or sue me <laughs> if I'm wrong. <laughs> We're going to have you back in 2030, Matt. It's <laughs> okay, deal. <laughs> That's fantastic. But, but I, yeah. I mean, the other thing I just wanted to say quickly was that I think that one of the big themes of the future is healthcare. We've seen a lot of computing innovation in the last 50 years. We saw a lot of transport innovation in the 50 years before that. My bet is that biotech is going to dominate the next 50 years. I, I, so many questions around that, around that issue as well. But the book is How Innovation Works, a fascinating look. Uh, the whole first, uh, most of the book is through stories of, of how innovation happens. And then uh, uh, very succinct chapters at the end, uh, drawing conclusions, which is fantastic. Available everywhere, I'm assuming, Matt. Yeah, it's been published in the UK and the US, and it's coming out in various foreign language editions as we speak. Well, thanks so much for joining us and talking about innovation. It's just fascinating. Really enjoyed talking to you. Thanks for having me on the show. Hey, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. So get this. There I am just catching up with my many, many, many fans over in the Stacking Benjamins basement group there in Facebook when a post catches my eye. Ian, Ian, doesn't think that I've got what it takes to be his in-home nanny. Are you kidding me, Ian? I was born a kid. I got lots of experience with childlike activities. In fact, I'll have you know that I've even been called an overgrown child on multiple occasions. Happens all the time. I swear, people, sometimes people like Ian don't get the level of experience that comes in this total package right here. While I write out my list to show Ian, Ian, just how wrong he is, chew on today's trivia. On this date in history, all the way back in 1937, Krispy Kreme Donuts was founded. Yum. According to an online survey of 60,000 votes, what is the best flavor of donut? I'll be back faster than you can change a dirty diaper, which I can do. Let's take a second, OG, and talk about finding freelance talent for your business or project because sometimes business needs to quickly pivot in order to meet a goal. Let's say as an example, your goal is uh, to make podcasts from anywhere and you think you're headed to Arizona. 
And that doesn't really happen, you know, hypothetically. And you end up in someone else's basement <laughs> there. for a long time. <laughs> Too long, you think? It's getting there. Or maybe an unexpected obstacle occurs, making it impossible to meet your deadline with the size of your current team. Where do you go to find on-demand talent? How much will it cost? How can you be certain that they'll deliver? Well, finding the right freelance talent can be time-consuming, frustrating, and expensive. That's where Fiverr comes in. Fiverr's platform helps keep businesses moving with a network of trusted freelance talent. I'll tell you, when we make the show, we have made so many shows that have featured Fiverr talent. And I know you've used Fiverr even in your financial planning business, OG. Yeah. The thing is, is that it's just super simple. You literally think of the thing that you need, go online, research a few people, boom, done. What number of times have you had something unexpected happen at Fiverr? Like unexpectedly bad? Yeah. Uh, zero. Yeah, I can't think of one yeah. that I've ever had. And I've been using Fiverr for years. So whether you're launching your first business, scaling your current business, or in need of extra support to complete a project, Fiverr's here to help you evolve, adapt, and grow. Fiverr connects businesses with freelancers who offer hundreds of digital services, including graphic design, copywriting, web programming, film editing, and more. Find what you're looking for instantly. You search by service, deadline, price, reviews, and more, and you'll know exactly what you're paying for up front. You don't have to negotiate. 24-7 customer service, quality talent you can count on. Sellers have worked with some of the finest and most influential brands in the world, like Stacking Benjamins. So finding talent has never been easier. Check out Fiverr.com today and receive 10% off your first order because you're a stacker by using OG and my code SB. Super easy. Find all the digital services you need in one place at F-I-V-E-R-R.com, code SB. Again, that's Fiverr.com, code SB. Hey, stackers, it's your favorite Manny, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. Not that guys can't be nannies. They totally can, but doesn't Manny, like man, nanny, get it? Doesn't it have a ring to it? Hey, before the break, you found out that my nemesis named Ian in our Facebook group has been hating on my in-home nanny skills. Well, Ian, here's a list of six reasons why you are oh so wrong. First... I was so good at kindergarten, my teachers had me do it twice just to show the other kids how it should be done. B, I'm well-versed in diapers, okay? I wore them till I was seven, managed to potty train myself by age 11. Beat that, Ian. Finally, I recently mastered bike riding. So those lessons, they're fresh in my mind. I'm happy to pass that wisdom on to some other chillins. And six, I could watch Disney Channel all day, like all day. So remember this, people, and you too, Ian. The next time you're about to diss on neighbor Doug, check your facts, brother. Now that I've straightened Ian out, let's get you to today's delicious trivia answer in honor of Krispy Kreme being founded on this day in 1937. I asked you what the best flavor of donut is according to an online poll, and we know how accurate those are. Coming in at number three, it's the Boston Cream Donut. Total hack job on this survey. Boston Cream, clearly number one, but I'll continue on because that's what the pros do. At number two, it's the Chocolate Donut. Gross, but scoring the number one spot, it's the Krispy Kreme Specialty, the Classic Glazed Donut. Oh yeah, that's another thing. Ian, donuts every day for kids when I'm their Manny. I'll be the best, most popular Manny ever. Hashtag Doug 2020. See you. Big thanks to Matt Ridley for stopping by. I love what he says about community because... I think, OG, if you're somebody who wants to, and if you're listening to this show, you're worried about your money, surrounding yourself with people who are going the same way, right? Is going to help you. like you. you. It's going to help you accidentally get there. But even people who will challenge your thinking a little bit. Sure. But still, people with kind of similar goals will help you help you get there. I loved his discussion about the Wright brothers. And about how they took all the available stuff, everything everybody was sharing, man, they were sharing back and forth what they were doing with other people. And I think sometimes 
people with a good idea, they want to hold it back and they want to think, no, 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 somebody's going to steal my idea. Somebody's going to take my stuff. I have seen far better things happen to people who freely share mm -hmm. than, uh, than people holding it back. Well, think about like uh, X Prize, how that whole thing started. Oh, that's a good point. I didn't think about that. People love competition. You're talking about money and being a tribe of people that are all moving in the same direction that you are because you want to know. I mean, people ask me, they asked you when you worked as an advisor, hey, so uh, I know I'm doing good, but how good am I doing? Like, how, how am I compared to your other clients? Right. Do I have more money or less? You know, am I saving more or less? Who's number one? How's my performance? And you're like, from a planning standpoint, hey, as long as you're on track for your goal, yeah, 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 yeah. On track for my goal, cool. But how am I really doing? Because <laughs> right. we, we're competitive. We want to win, you know? So when I say iron sharpens iron, how many different other analogies can I come up with? And initially, like he said, we resist innovation, right? He had that whole story about coffee and about trying to put coffee down, which I thought was just awesome. How are you going to put coffee? So addictive. How are you going to put coffee down? But much like with innovation, we kind of shun it, even though we say, oh, innovation's cool. Innovation's great. When there's something innovative, immediately we go, oh, the world's changing. Oh boy. Oh, everything's going to be bad now. Well, Tony the Robbins talks about certainty and uncertainty depending on where you are in your life and depending on what's going on, it will matter more to you whether or not you want that certainty of status quo or you want the uncertainty of potentially what might happen down the line. I don't think that's something that just stays where it is. Take the most recent, you know, chaos going on around all the, all the uh, virus stuff, right? I mean, for a while we all wanted the certainty of if I just stay at home, then I'm good. And then after staying at home and having all that certainty, people went, yeah, I'll take some uncertainty. Please, God. <laughs> like I, I crave uncertainty. And then that happened. Yes. And now it's like, yeah, I'm going to, I want some certainty again. I'm going back little, to A little certainty. too far of uncertain, a little more. So I'm certainly going to stay at home. So it's an ever evolving thing. So, but I think you're right when it comes to sharing ideas and sometimes it's so difficult. You, you said something that made me think of, you said sometimes people have good ideas and they don't want to share them. And immediately I thought that's why they never turn into great ideas because good ideas with somebody else's good idea, right. with somebody else's good idea turns into one great idea. Which is why we didn't get into this a lot, but in his book, uh, which was fascinating, Matt talks about how the inventor rarely gets wealthy. And if they do get wealthy, they get wealthy with a bunch of other people around sure. them. But that person doesn't end up becoming the person on the hill because they, they were the thought leader in that area. Right. Uh, they may get wealthy, but it'll be on the fact that, uh, you know, now they do a speaking tour. Well, again, back to it. like XPRIZE, and I'm not totally familiar with this, but just anecdotally, who started XPRIZE? Peter Diamandis, right? Who won the first XPRIZE? It was $10 million. Who won? I, I don't know. But I know that Peter has all these other irons in the fire. Right. He's got stuff going on with space. He's got stuff going on with going to Mars. He's got stuff going on with, you know, longevity. He's got stuff going on with human genome stuff. He's the person that I remember, not because he created he he said, hey, I'm going to put together a, a, a contest. He kind of brought the think tank together. Yeah. And yeah. so he he comes up with the idea. He's the one who manages the whole idea flow, so to speak. And to your point, the innovator. The guy who created the solution, yeah, he won or they won, whatever, you know, whatever the first thing was about. And since then, they've created other things. They're trying to do stuff with water and stuff, you know, so it's uh, very interesting. Stuff. Boy, thanks again to Matt Ridley for stopping by. Fantastic discussion. Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline, OG, and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first. Oh, boy. After a... Bender of a weekend. I'm going to go with uh, three Advil and two Tylenol in a glass of water. It sure was fun. That, uh, uh, but it was with family and I guess friends. Okay. All right. I'll take a, I'll take a distant second there. That's fun. Oh, I was talking about Cheryl. Oh, of course. I, I should have known that. Uh, it's your loved ones and your time. Your loved ones like your co-host and your time. Mm -hmm. That's why they've created a modern way to buy quality term life insurance. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now to get a free quote. 
OG's like, uh, is your life insurance up to date, Joe? Because uh, we got this key man insurance policy yeah. that we, we, need, we need to make sure. Uh, at Haven Life, their prices are affordable. Policies issued by parent company Mass Mutual, over 160 years old. Applications easy and online. And today, we are throwing out uh, the lifeline to Adam. Say hi, Adam. Why does it seem that with 100 years of market data showing clear trends, people, including those in the finance space, both personal finance and otherwise, continue to make the same mishaps? The immediate effects of COVID-19 on health, the economy, and the market were very scary. No argument from any rational person about that. But people panicking and pulling out of the market, switching suddenly to quote-unquote safe investments, and making knee-jerk reactions are the scariest of effects of COVID to cause an impact on their futures. Any natural disaster, war, or other catalyst for a bear market or downturn could have occurred over the last 10 years of our long-enjoyed bull market. These events will eventually happen and the market will eventually return to yield overall profits. These events are not new, and their causes are always a surprise. Otherwise, they would not yield a downturn. People who made knee-jerk reactions after any of these type of events in the past, including the current COVID, which still isn't finished, by the way, end up worse off because they didn't steady their own course. The lessons from COVID are clear. First, emergency funds are imperative. That's number one. Also, we have to diversify ahead of time. And the market is not the same as the economy. And finance nerds even keep interchanging these two words, unfortunately. And finance experts, ironically, will be the first to answer questions with, I don't know. But why do we keep messing all of these up? I was amazed that there was a question at the end of that. <laughs> like, I, y y yes. I thought that Adam just needs his own podcast because mm -hmm. because uh, I think I agree with a bunch of what Adam said. But what's interesting is so there are people who pulled out Adam, but but also let's be clear the market's gone up. Markets go up for a reason, right? There's people who have not only stuck in. There's people who have doubled down. OG. So there are people making some big profit. Dave Portnoy. I know. I was gonna say Dave's killing it. Bye bye bye. Here's what you do, Adam. You just put some random some letters random together. Letters. You, you hit buy, 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 and you watch it go up, up, up. You you subscribe to OG's FUDP newsletter, and uh, and 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 there you go. Yeah, I don't know that there's much commentary to add here. I, I mean, back to our previous conversation about certainty and uncertainty. People want certainty, and I agree completely with just about everything. I guess everything he said. We. Minded people make weak decisions. And you and I had a discussion though in the car yesterday about this that there are people who get all the facts, they get all the numbers, they get everything. And for who knows what reason, they still decide to make the wrong decision. We were talking about an investor who decided to go with a portfolio that, that had oh. subpar performance. Yeah at least double the fees, maybe triple the fees, All in. had the wrong definition of diversification, had all these facts, has all these resources, still decides they got to make the wrong move. Yeah. The reason that people don't just set it and forget it and turn off CNBC, I have a theory on this that's evolving. But right now, my theory is because of all the lost time, where people finally start thinking about this generically around age 40 to 50 and then go, oh my God, I haven't done anything. All my friends, air quotes, which by the way, none of your friends have done this, but even though they say they have, all of my friends are gazillionaires. They're not. I need to catch up. And I can't do it the way that's the boring $500 a month in my Roth and 1000 bucks a month into my 401k. I can't do that way. Because I'm behind, so I have to do the subscribe to the newsletter because stocks only go up way. I have to do it the way of I'm going to trade on Robinhood because of what Reddit said. And then they get blown up. And when they get blown up, then they double down. They, you almost have to double down on that. So it's because of the fact that there's not a comfortable enough conversation with being okay with where you are and recognizing it just is what it is. You know, one of the things that I'm trying to tell my uh, new planners is that we have to provide hope and optimism because if you show up in my office or on a phone call 
and you haven't done much and you're feeling pretty blue about that or you've done some wrong things. Maybe you did what Adam said not to do. So it's March 20th. The market's down 11%. It's five minutes before the close. And you go, you know what? Screw this. I am out. I am done getting my face kicked in. And then the next day it goes up 10% and you go, eh, just a, just a little rebound. And then two months later, you're like, damn, when should I get back in? Yeah. That happens. You don't need me to tell you, you made a bad choice. What value does it provide? And this is, you know, you see these people on on the internet and bloggers do this and radio hosts do this. like, well, that's just stupid. I get it. People who have credit card debt or $150,000 of student loans understand that it's a little too much. So what do you have to do instead? You have to just say, okay, here's where we are. Here's what we've got to do differently. Let's make a plan to get there. And if you can methodically work through that or methodically think about it in a way that provides you with the step-by-step direction in order to do that, there's a greater likelihood of being okay. I mean, it's just, um, I don't know. I don't know what else I was going to say. I'm just rambling. No, but I like your ramble because I think as you're talking, you know, we talk about how it's stupid and people don't want to be stupid. And I do think that people first come to the table to do better with their money because of the result of a mistake or not wanting to make a mistake. But I found a lot of the time, either there was a life event, you know, there was some trigger, a baby was born a retirement's around the corner, like you were talking about, whatever it might be, or they made a bad mistake and they don't want to do that anymore. But I think different than the whole shaming, that is stupid thing. I don't know, man, I'm starting to believe that mistakes are powerful. Like that's the beginning Making a bad mistake is the beginning. Maybe it's knocking yourself out of this malaise that you're in mm-hmm. and go, man, I just completely screwed that thing up and I can't afford to do that again. And then that's a powerful thing because then you start to learn. Then you realize that it's fun. Well, and then- think of it from a different perspective. Take money out of it and use your health instead. Do you know anybody that's had a quasi non-serious, I'm using air quotes, heart attack, and then all of a sudden got super healthy? I do. I, you know, I've got family members. They're like, oh, wow, hey, man, you look good. You lost money. Yeah, <laughs> health scare. Yeah. Like, boom. Yeah. Fear of God. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm done eating bread. I don't care. I love bread. I'm done eating it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or, you know, you have some smoking issue or something. You go, I'm done smoking. I'm out. Like, I, I, I get it now. I mean, we all know intuitively that the copious amounts of adult beverages that, that that we sometimes imbibe with. It's just, you know, it's probably not the greatest things for our liver. Like, we get that, you know? I shouldn't have had the loaf of bread yesterday for dinner. It was so good. It was good bread. In fact, you know, I was pretty pretty upset I didn't have another loaf of bread. I mean, we had this big spaghetti meal yesterday, and it was just delicious. But, you know, I mean, so we get it, but it takes something to shake us out of it, like you said. And those of us who do take our health seriously and kind of know where to toe the line and that sort of thing, you can't help but look at somebody who doesn't, right? And you just kind of shake your head and go, gosh, I just don't get it. They just don't get it. How can you be smoking that much? How can you do that thing to your body? Just <sighs> tisk, 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 right? But have you ever seen a gym person or a, or a health coach walk up to somebody and go, you are disgustingly fat. You need to exercise more. Let's go run. You know, you, you, that, 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 would, that person would be like, eh, whatever. Not the good ones. Screw you, buddy. Yeah. You know? I yeah. mean, Angelo was on a couple of days ago, right? And he yeah. was talking about, he f- tries to figure out what motivates you. Is it competition? Is it you got to do better than me? Is it like you got to look good? Is it, you know, where is your vanity? And the same thing's true when it comes to money. You know, gosh, I, I listened to some of these, these shows. I was just, I spent. 1,300 miles driving last week. It was amazing. I highly encourage everyone to do that. Um, <laughs> in the, uh, what, did, what did I call it? What did I call her minivan? I called it the, uh, oh, it was a Maybach. Somebody sent me a picture of a Maybach. And I said, I said, oh, yeah, we have the Toyota version of a Maybach. <laughs> Toyota. <laughs> <laughs> the Sienna. It's gray with gray interior. It's the it's the blandest car ever. It's like it's just like a bowl of brown rice. 
<laughs> it's gray with gray interior and gray floor mats. And blah. Maybe that's why you love flying so much is because your car is so depressing to get into. <laughs> well, that and it goes way slower than an airplane. You're like, come on. Straight line. I could have been there seven hours ago. Oh, it's, not, it's worse than that. I could have been there 17 hours ago. But anyways, I think when it comes down to all of this stuff, to answer Adam's question in a long, long, long drawn out way, be okay with where you are. Well, I also feel like it's more about the process than it is. When you give away that you will never know anything, you begin then working on a process of answering questions as they arise rather than being obsessed with the fact that I can't answer this question right now. You and I were talking about uh, a mutual friend of ours who was upset because they weren't doing this kind of trivial thing super successfully. And I've seen people get so frustrated with themselves because they make a, a simple mistake. Like golf. That they refuse to, they refuse to improve. They can't improve because they get so angry all the time and they're, they get in their own way. And I think if you instead embrace more of a growth mindset where you, Hey, I, I'm going to screw up everything today. And if I do, guess what I did? That Thomas Edison thing. I, I learned 9,000 ways not to make a light bulb, right? You know, and, and if you adopt that mindset, I think it's a lot more powerful. I think mistakes are a huge, powerful thing. Uh, making the same mistake over and over again, though. I also think, though, when Adam's talking about people making the same mistakes over and over again, I think it's usually, I mean, don't get me wrong. We talked about that one person that we can't figure out, right? Somebody who has all the answers and decide to make all the wrong moves. Yeah. They, they should know everything. They've got all the resources. They've been presented all the facts. Still decide to make the wrong move. Okay. Can't account for that. But I don't think that's most people, OG. I think there's a new crop of people making mistakes all the time because there's 330 million of us in the United States and there's a fairly small financial community. We're always surprised when somebody enters our world and goes, hey, guess what? I'm another person who screwed up credit cards. You're like, another one? Oh my. Well, yeah. I mean, look in the basement. How many people show up and go, hey, so I was thinking, should I max out my Roth? Right. And you go, hey, have you not read it? And like, that's my initial reaction, by the way. Yeah. And uh, I know this. Again? I, uh, can someone else answer this, please? Just a new crop of people on the conveyor but, belt. But that's great. Yeah. You know, it's a great it's, place it's, to start. Uh, um, anyways. So. <laughs> Thanks for the question. <laughs> you going to put a ta-da on the end of that? <laughs> Isn't there an applause? Where, press the applause button. There it is. You're welcome. You're welcome, everybody. What does this button do? <laughs> <laughs> Laugh track. We don't want to do that one because because that, that was a we were very serious there. Uh, thanks, Adam, for that question. And by the way, for the pontification before the question, by the way, spot on. If you've got a question for us, head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. And uh, we're sending Adam out a T-shirt for being brave enough to do that. A greatest money show on earth T-shirt that represents graphically what a circus it is here uh, in the basement. Uh, also, thanks to anybody who's left us a review of this here show. Got a great one from Dave. Real wisdom interlaced in the humor. I don't think this guy knows us. Oh, gee, what's this about? Stacky Benjamin sneaks financial insights into a funny, entertaining show. It's like these guys want to teach about money without the listener realizing they're being taught. Dave, we're not trying to teach anything. And if you do learn anything, you should keep it to yourself because you're going to ruin our reputation, big guy. They, <laughs> thanks for that. Mom is very proud of that. It has that on the fridge. Last, but definitely not least, if you're somebody who needs help with your money more than just listening to a show, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash OG, and that will lead you to OG and his team. They're taking clients, and uh, you can see how you might be able to plug them in to do better with your money. All right, that's going to do it for today. Doug, you've got it from here, man. So what should we have learned today? First, take a lesson from our headline and M1 Finance's Brian Barnes. Dave Portnoy, fun guy at a party and maybe not your best source of financial information. Who knew? Second, take a lesson from Matt Ridley. Want to innovate? Look to join a community because innovation happens when people are free to bounce ideas off each other. But the big takeaway? Joe's mom just informed me. Apparently, when you're an in-home nanny, you got to sometimes watch kids for like an entire day. Yeah, that's not going to work for me. I got things to do. You know, I'm not quite sure 
it's okay to put a car seat in the back of an El Camino anyway. Safety first. I'm all about safety for the kids. Big thanks to Matt Ridley for joining us to talk innovation. Here's something innovative. We've placed a link to buy his book through bookshop.org on our show notes page. That way, you can support both independent booksellers and the show. Head to stackingbenjamins.com for all of our show notes. This show is created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rudder Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at SBenjaminsCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I really thought doing these credits completely naked would have been a lot more fun than it actually was. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remunerations. That's a big word. There's no way you take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. And before making any financial decisions, consult with a real financial advisor. Welcome to the after show. This is the part of the show that doesn't exist. If you're still here, you're still here. Go home. But I if you, am, if you I am home, actually, if you are still here and you don't want to go home, OG and I will talk sometimes about video games, funny stuff. We think uh, about stuff that happens today. Like to talk about something a lot of us are doing. I think it's a great time to share things that we really like on TV. Because <laughs> if you're like me, you're starting to run out. You know what? I watch like 20 minutes at lunchtime of Schitt's Creek. Basically, <sighs> I get through like one ep- almost one episode. So good. Break. But I mean, for three, we've been up at, in Michigan for three weeks. I don't think I spent, but maybe a cumulative one hour watching TV. Because it's all, it's all, you know, it's all reruns and stuff. Well, it depends. I mean, for me, it's all Netflix and yeah, we don't have any of that. Amazon, those things. This is a new series I found, actually, while uh, at your house, uh, Cheryl and I were flipping through Netflix, and we said we want to watch something a little campy. This is a, a show on Netflix called The Order. Magic swirls all around us. It is in the air that we breathe. Do not be so naive as to think we are the only ones who can harness its power. Nothing is as it seems. Congratulations on your acceptance to Belgrave University. We have a question. What do you know about the Hermetic Order of the Blue Rose? Everyone knows the Order is fake news. about to start the biggest adventure of your lives. What is reality? It appears you've been summoned. Will you heed the call? Yes. We'll be expecting great things from you. Welcome to the Order. I'm going to teach you how to use magic properly. A tutor. You got stuck with me for some reason. Just lucky, I guess. There is a crazy- and uh, they go into the story then, but this is a story of a kid who, at the beginning of the show, OG, you find out that his mother is deceased, and dad doesn't know that the kid exists. Dad is the head of this order called the Order of the Blue Rose, this magical society that exists 
kind of underground at this university, it's Belgrave University. By the way, it's a beautiful campus. I don't know where the heck this place was filmed, but uh, looks like someplace, um, uh, I don't know, northeast, big leafy trees, old buildings, you know, very Harvard-esque. It narrows it down. Looking place. Yeah, it could be 9,000 different places. As you heard in the trailer, he asked about this Order of the Blue Rose. The woman tells him it doesn't exist. Then he gets invited to be in the Order for the Blue Rose. He gets accepted. Now he's on his way into magic. At the same time, in episode one, people are being killed. And like any good show, half of the characters are not what you think they are at the beginning. People have secret motivations. And now I've worked my way, uh, Cheryl and I have worked our way through the first half of, of the first year. I was looking for something that was much like the Netflix uh, Sabrina, you know, campy, magic, silly, nearly brain dead, but not completely brain dead. And man, that's what I got. And if I was going to give this a ranking, it's funny because I just pulled up the ranking now, but I was thinking even as I was pulling up the ranking, what would I give this? I called about a seven out of 10. IMDB, 6.9 out of 10. Nice. Um, Bam. Very good. So pretty close. But don't get me wrong, for what I wanted it for, the reason I wanted to watch it, it's a 10. It is an absolute, it is a Who's well- Who's the uh, actor that I overheard saying like, do you accept it? Da, da, da. Oh, he- I'm Trying to like picture, I'm trying to picture what movie he's in. I got to tell you, he's some total beefcake dude. And uh, he is Jack, the main character's dad. His name is uh, Max Martini. He plays the part of Edward Coventry. Let's see what he's been in in the past. Tell, tell me a movie that I've seen him in and what character he was. Oh, you, you've you definitely seen him. <laughs> <laughs> All he's been in are action flicks. Okay, name one. All right, here we go. Before the order, he was in Sergeant Will Gardner. I don't know that He one. was in The Unit. Okay. Oh. 13 Hours, The Secret so, Soldiers of Benghazi. Who was who he in The Unit? He was in Saving Private Ryan. That was a long time ago. It's going to be hard to remember from that one. Yeah. Uh, who was he in the unit? Let's take a look. Oh, he was uh, He was Mac. I've watched the unit twice. He's Mac. Yeah. Red haired dude. Yes. Man, the dude is just ripped. Just. Abs- I mean, yeah. Like, yes. Yeah. Kind of like me. But but anyway, big thumb up. If, if you're looking for some for some campy, silly magic university student not but okay i was gonna say you're, i think you yawned as i got halfway through that it's exactly what i want if you're not looking for that don't see it but i would say that uh so far and i'm only through half of the first season compared to if you liked the netflix version of sabrina which i really liked at first and i'm tiring of kind of quickly but i've watched three seasons so so Didn't tire of it that quickly. So far, I think I like it a little better. I think I like it a little better. So that's the order on Netflix. 